2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And from what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to the faithful men who will also be able to share and teach others also. Our dog swallowed a bag of Scrabble tiles. We took him to the vet to see if he's okay. No word yet. You know what the best thing about Switzerland is? I don't know, but its flag is a big plus. <sighs> Went to McDonald's today and ate a kid's meal. His mom was not happy about it. My son was chewing on electrical cords. I had to ground him. But currently, he's conducting himself properly now. For those who argue that pastors only work on the weekends, the video is proof, isn't it? The fact that we roped Matt in to be part of our shenanigans is perhaps the biggest miracle of all. I think you expect that from Jason, Luke, and I. Like, we're rarely serious, but to get Matt involved, too, is really, really fun. So thanks for letting us share that with you. And... Uh, Perhaps the most disappointing thing is that Jace just cannot hold a straight face. You'd think, youth pastor, he could pull that off, but no. Anyway, it is so great to be with you this morning. Uh, my name is Mark. I serve as the adult ministries pastor, and whether you are with us somewhere in the building or you're watching online, we're really glad you're with us this morning. It's a privilege to spend some time with you. Uh, here it is, Father's Day, and as I've grown older and as the years have accumulated, uh, Father's Day often causes me to reminisce and begin to think more deeply about uh, all the different people, uh, including my father, but other men and even other women who have been influences on me throughout my life. I become somewhat nostalgic and I think about individuals who have really worked hard to pour into me to help me become the person that I've become. I want to share just a couple of quick stories with you. The first one, of course, is my own personal dad, my biological dad, Dave Young. Uh, not everyone gets to have a great relationship with their dad. I am very blessed that I had a great time with my dad in the years that we had together. And uh, I learned a lot of things from my dad. He was uh, just an incredible leader, especially a servant leader. Uh, he really poured himself into people. He really gave himself to people, but was very uh, professional about it. Uh, I learned from my dad the idea of being above reproach, to be the kind of person that can be trusted, uh, that can have a good name, that it, not to accumulate for yourself, but so that you can really be uh, a beneficial person to others. Uh, hardly anyone ever had a bad thing to say about my dad, and I appreciated that about him, that he worked hard to build good relationships. I also got my sense of humor from my dad. And uh, just to give you an idea of what that was like growing up, as far back as I can remember, any time salad was served for a meal, my dad would utter the phrase, let us pray. <laughs> you thought the puns were over with the video. They're not. <laughs> uh, my favorite story to tell about my dad that gives you a window into what he was like and helps you better understand what I'm like uh, so my dad and I both worked at Northwest Christian School for quite a while. He was a superintendent, I was a teacher, but he also would teach a class occasionally. 
and uh, loved to teach the, the class of psychology that we offered to mostly seniors. And one particular day, uh, a young man came running into class right as the bell rang and sat in the far back corner next to the back door. And throughout the class, my dad told the story that he noticed this young man kept uh, reaching out around the back door and even a couple times asked if he could go to the bathroom and went out the back door and then he'd come back in. And so at some point, my dad had them distracted and he wandered over and he noticed that this young student had a can of soda outside the door that he had been sipping on throughout class. Now, some teachers would get upset, call the student out, make a big spectacle, not my dad. Also, when the student was, wasn't looking, my dad wandered over, opened the door, and took his lukewarm coffee and poured some into the can of soda, didn't say a word, finished class, class ends, bell rings, this young man pops up, goes out the back door, grabs his can of soda, my dad leans out the other door, and as this kid takes a big swig, looks, looks back at my dad, to see my dad with his coffee cup just give him a nod and a wink, and on he went. That's my father. And that better explains me too, doesn't it? A little bit, that I grew up with that. Another individual had incredible significance in my life. I jump ahead to my freshman year of high school, and a new teacher came to the school I was attending. Uh, his name is Rick Lazier. And Rick was fresh out of college. He was an amazing individual. Uh, he impacted all of us right away. All the guys wanted to be him. All the girls wanted to marry him. Uh, he was athletic. He was brilliant. Uh, he was funny. Uh, he was, but the first two years of my high school experience, uh, Rick was my math teacher, my Bible teacher, and my basketball coach. I spent the majority of my adult years as a math teacher, a Bible teacher, and a basketball coach. I really just wanted to be Rick. And so I grew up to try to be him and emulate him. That's how much of an impact he had on me. And there were even a few people in the room this morning who also attended Northwest Christian, and I got to work with him there, and they took classes with Rick. And he's often talked about very fondly because he had an amazing way to impact students in a way that they wanted to then also impact people. And I really owe a lot of what I've become as an individual when I think about serving others from what I learned from Rick. And to have him as a high school teacher, and then years later, he's the one who called me and recruited me to come to Phoenix to begin teaching at Northwest Christian 32 years ago. And so Rick is a very, very special person, and he has poured a lot into me over the years. The third individual came along later in life, I'm in my 30s at this point, and uh, a gentleman came to teach at the school with us, and his name is Bill Harbeck. Bill came to teach and coach. Uh, he was from the Chicago area and had been in Christian education for, forever and was just so wise. Uh, and one of the first times I remember having a conversation with him, I asked him, so why have you stayed in Christian education all these years? And you could have maybe done something else, but you moved from Chicago to Phoenix to continue teaching. And he gave me a phrase that has really impacted me now for 20-some years. And he said, Mark, it's real simple. My goal is to pursue their hearts. We'll teach them the content along the way, but my goal and my job is to pursue their hearts. And I never forgot that, and that really motivated me in my teaching and even working now in church ministry to pursue people's hearts and get to know them and understand them. Bill was amazing. He would know something interesting about every person, every student. Oh, this student likes this. This student's artist artistic. This student likes to ride horses. This student is funny. Amazing in how he would know that. The other thing I can thank Bill for is because he's from Chicago, he introduced me to Portillo's. And I remember the first time he said, all right, we're gonna, I'm going to order for you. You're going to get Italian beef dipped with sweet peppers and a cake shake. And I thought I had died and gone to heaven. And if you eat that meal enough, you will die and go to heaven. But it's tasty in the moment. And uh, so we've had, multi even now, he's retired, and we, about once a month, we get together at Portillo's and have lunch. And just, I am not who I am today without those three men and many other people like them. Uh, who have impacted me in amazing ways. And I believe 
that if we were to sit down and have individual conversations with everyone in the room, you probably also have people in your life, at various places in your life, that have been incredibly influential, that have shaped you and molded you to become the people you are today. Now, unfortunately, sometimes those who influence us are, are, are a negative influence. I want us to think this morning about those who have been a positive influence in your life over the years. And we're saying it this way this morning to kind of get us up and running. Uh, all of us have someone, or hopefully you have several someones in your life who have impacted you in a profound way. It could have been a family member, maybe it's a parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, cousin, older sibling. Perhaps it's a family friend. I think for a lot of people, if we were to ask them, uh, they would mention someone that was probably a teacher. Uh, elementary teachers are amazing. The fact that they would stay with kids all day long. That's why I taught secondary. I see you for 50 minutes, then I can get rid of you. <laughs> and not till the next day do I have to see you again. But elementary teachers would stay with you all day long. And uh, I always am asking people, like, give me someone that was influential in your life, and many people will mention a teacher at some point in time. Uh, if you've been around church quite a bit, it could be a pastor, youth pastor, maybe a, a, a sponsor within the youth group, or someone in kids' ministry. Uh, we all have these people, right, in our lives. Hopefully, you can think of at least one, maybe more than one, who have just impacted you at the right moment in time. Uh, someone who has left a lasting impression on us. Uh, who spoke truth and wisdom into us at a time when we needed it the most. Oftentimes, timing is a big part of this. Uh, who gave us good advice, pointed us in the right direction, and poured their life into ours. And so maybe throughout the rest of our morning, in the back of your mind, kind of be thinking about those people who've impacted you and influenced you along the way. Have you ever thought, have you ever given any time to thinking about who influenced the people who influenced you? Uh, picture for a moment uh, a family tree. Perhaps at some point in your life or maybe even in school, you had to put together a family tree where you went and researched parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and you went back maybe several generations. Uh, oftentimes, people will like to go back to who were the first folks who came to America from their family. It's always fascinating how everyone wants to try to find that famous person in their life. Like I often would tell students, not everyone can be related to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, but you do your family tree, right? You kind of find out where you've come from and the people who have, over the years, <laughs> created you. Well, think for a moment about a spiritual family tree. Think of the individuals who introduced you to Jesus, have, have maybe shaped your walk with Jesus, people who have really poured into you to help you become a better follower of Jesus, I wonder who did the same for them. And who did the same for them? I think of the people in my life who have helped shape my understanding of what it means to follow Jesus, and I think about, I wonder who shared with them, and then who shared with those folks. And probably all of us, if we were able to do that, and maybe one day when we stand together in eternity, maybe that'll be part of it. We can go back and we can research and find and we can be introduced to the folks who helped create your spiritual family tree. Wouldn't well, that sound fun? That sound great? I'd love to meet some of these people. And I often think like probably all of us, if we're Jesus followers, we trace ourselves back to eventually that, what, 120 in the upper room in Acts chapter 1 and 2 that kind of began the church. Like it all kind of started from there more or less, and yet here we are thousands of years later. Isn't that fascinating? Think about the people who have influenced the, the folks who influenced you. And that's where we're going to go for a few minutes this, this morning, kind of thinking about this idea of the importance of influence in our lives. And the Apostle Paul writes about this idea of a transition of influence. He writes about this in his second letter to Timothy. Uh, the passage that Rachel just read for us a couple moments ago. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn there. Uh, we'll be there just for a few minutes and look at some other places. But in this second letter that Paul writes to Timothy, he makes this comment here in chapter 2 uh, that is very powerful. And when you understand the context behind it, you can see why Paul said what he said. 
If you're not familiar with 2 Timothy, it's not a very large book. It maybe hasn't been in your life very much. Uh, This is, as much as we can tell, Paul's last letter. Paul is writing this from Rome in prison. It's the second time he's in prison. The first time was house arrest, which really was just like you're confined to a one-room house with guards, but he had some freedom. This time, Nero's in power, and Nero is systematically wiping through the Christian community, and Paul has been rearrested, and now he is in one of the worst prisons in Rome, essentially a hole in the ground. He's an older man, could be in his 60s, perhaps, and he's awaiting execution. And in that moment, Paul has the capacity, and some have wondered if maybe he was able to dictate this to Luke, perhaps was with him, and he dictated one more letter to his protege and mentee, a young man named Timothy. So this is Paul's last letter. It's his most personal letter. I've often thought about this letter as uh, under the heading, one more thing before I go. (laughs) It's as if Paul's, hey, Timothy, one more thing. Oh, remember preach this. Oh, remember to think this. Oh, talk to these people. Hey, remember, it's the baton passing from Paul to Timothy that is the context of this letter. And in chapter 2, in our chapter 2, Paul says this to Timothy. He says, you then, my son, what a term of affection, Uh, you then, my son, be strong, literally be empowered in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then the second verse is the verse we're going to drill down on for a while this morning. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. Stop for a moment and think about that. Timothy traveled with Paul for about two decades, off and on for about 20 years. They first meet towards the middle of Paul's first missionary journey. And Timothy begins to travel with Paul, and occasionally Paul would leave Timothy in places to do some extra work, but they would eventually reconnect. And for 20 years, Timothy has been by Paul's side. Think of the countless messages he has heard Paul give. As far as we know, Paul probably started at least 14 churches during his time, maybe more, at least 14 that we can read of in the New Testament. Thousands of messages, thousands of people interacted with, sitting next to Paul as he would Uh, build tents to sell in the marketplace and having conversations with people. So, when Paul says to Timothy, all the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, that's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff. Take that, Paul said, and entrust to reliable people. Entrust these things to reliable people who will then also be qualified to teach others. So, what we have here, folks, is a transition of influence. Paul is describing a transition of influence, where Paul has said, start with Paul. Paul, I have influenced and I have given myself to you, Timothy, in a large way. Timothy, I want you to take the things that you have heard from me, things you've heard in front of many witnesses, and now you're to transition those into the hearts and minds of reliable people with the hope that they then would go on and teach others. We have a blueprint for biblical influence laid right before us by Paul in 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. I've poured into you, Timothy. It's your turn to pour into others, reliable people who will teach others also. Now, Paul knows this from personal experience. Uh, Timothy isn't the only person that Paul has poured into. If you've ever read through the New Testament, specifically the book of Acts, you'll notice several individuals who traveled with Paul. He had a Paul posse, guys that would be with him through most of his missionary journeys, men that we know by the name of Barnabas, Silas, Luke, Timothy, of course, countless others. Uh, When we get to the end of the book of Romans here in a couple months, when we jump back into Romans after this week, uh, if you want to do a sneak peek, look at chapter 16 and the number of people that Paul mentions by name that he is discipling or has discipled, he's poured into, he knows by name. Paul is very well networked when he comes to pouring into others. But Paul was also on the receiving end of influence as well. It didn't just begin with him. 
Jump with me if you want to in your text, or it'll be on the screen if you want to watch along. Uh, in the book of Galatians, we get a little insight into Paul's origin story as he began to follow Jesus. In the book of Galatians, which, by the way, is Paul's first letter, so we're kind of bookending Paul's life this morning, his last letter, 2 Timothy, first letter, Galatians. And in Galatians, in the early chapters, Paul lays out his journey to Jesus. You may be familiar with the fact that Paul was a Pharisee steeped in Judaism. He calls himself the Pharisee of Pharisees, and that isn't bragging. He really was top of the class. And yet he has this amazing encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and his life does a 180 just like that. And Paul is detailing the events that led from his conversion to Jesus up until the moment that essentially he's writing this letter to the Galatian churches. And we pick it up in Galatians 1, 18 and 19, where Paul is describing this process. And after he believes in Jesus, he leaves Damascus, mostly because they were ready to kill him. And he spends three years in the country or the region of Arabia by himself. And I would even argue, to use maybe some modern terminology, that Paul has to figure out the Judaism that he was deeply invested in. Now what do I do with that, that I believed in the Jesus that I was actually in opposition to? And you could almost argue that Paul deconstructs his faith in the Arabian desert, but then reconstructs his faith in Jesus, working through the Old Testament Scriptures in a new way. And so Paul says, at the end of those three years, then after the three years, he says, I went up to Jerusalem. And some translations say to get acquainted or to meet with. It really is more Paul has come to investigate. Uh, the word is historici. It means to investigate or obtain information. The word history you can hear in there. Paul goes to Jerusalem to investigate with Cephas. And we've talked before uh, in previous weeks that Cephas is the uh, Aramaic name for Peter. Peter and Cephas both mean rock, but in two different languages. So Paul goes up to Jerusalem to meet with Peter for 15 days, and he also meets with James. And so for a little over two weeks, Paul shows up in Jerusalem after three years by himself in Arabia and investigates. I just get the sense that he just peppered those two gentlemen with questions and conversation after conversation. Well, what does this mean, or how do we put this together? Jump down to chapter 2, verse 9. Now we get toward the end of Paul's uh, epic or origin story, and he says in Galatians 2.9, and so now when James, Cephas, Peter, and John, who had a reputation as pillars, they were well known to be the leaders within the Jerusalem church, they recognized the grace that had been given to me, so they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we would go to the Gentiles and they would go to the circumcised. They would stay in Israel and Paul and Barnabas would begin to journey through the Gentile world. Now, what's fascinating, everyone, is that between Galatians 1, the passage we read, and Galatians 2, there's 14 years of life in between those two statements. He meets with Peter and James for 15 days, and then he, for 14 years, works in various churches in northern Israel and even maybe even to the east, and just toils away working in churches, learning his craft, Barnabas is probably at his side, and for 14 years, Paul essentially goes through somewhat of an apprenticeship. And at the end of those 14 years, he goes back to Jerusalem, and they commission him, and from Antioch, kind of home base in the north, they spread out and begin their missionary journey. So really, the transaction more looks like this. The transaction of influence looks like this. Uh, James, Peter, and John poured into Paul who poured into Timothy, who has been told by Paul in 2 Timothy to pour into reliable people. Paul has been influenced, and he is influencing others. This is the blueprint for biblical influence. Influence others the way you've been influenced. Invest in others the way you've been invested in. An illustration that I love to use that I've seen before and used multiple times that kind of helps me visualize this is this idea. Paul is telling Timothy, look, uh, the pitcher represents Paul. Pitcher, Paul. Helpful, right? 
Paul's telling Timothy, look, I've invested in you. I have literally poured into you. And the things that I have poured into you, I want you to invest in, I want you to pour in, I want you to influence others, influence others, so that they in turn can then also influence other people. And the transaction continues. Paul is asking Timothy to do this. I want you to pour out what's been poured in. Pour out what's been poured in. I've poured into you, you need to pour into others. And the more we get poured into, the more opportunity we have to pour into others, and then they can pour into others. And there's just blue liquid for all to have. <laughs> now, this is the ideal. The ideal transaction is this. But let's talk for a couple minutes about the real. Because for most of our lives, what we're trying to do is get our real to match up with the ideal. And the ideal is this, but the real often looks very different. In fact, there's multiple ways that this becomes, unfortunately, dysfunctional in our lives. Uh, there are, I thought of a couple different ways that either on our decision-making or on other people's decision-making, this transaction of influence sometimes doesn't go as smoothly as Paul would like it to be or as smoothly as I just showed in front of you. And the first dysfunction that often we encounter is when people want to influence us, they want to pour into us, but either through pride or fear, it's often one of those two, we don't want to be poured into. In fact, we've pretty much closed ourselves off, and we've lit it ourselves up. Now, we may have been influenced at one point in time a little bit, or perhaps not at all, but we've now decided that we're done with people, and I'm not letting anybody in anymore. And there is no way I'm going to let someone fill this, because they will probably fail me, or they'll give me bad advice, or perhaps they may actually get too well-known to me. We may get too intimate, and now I'm sharing really deep, dark things that I don't want to share with someone, and that's very uncomfortable, because I'm very vulnerable and transparent. And so we put a lid on. And you know what happens when we, oh, I won't do it. But can you imagine? Someone tries to pour into you, but you've decided you want, don't want to be invested in. And all it does is just create a huge mess. So that's one dysfunction. When perhaps people are willing to pour into us, but we don't want to be poured into. A second dysfunction happens perhaps when we're very willing for people to pour into us, we love it that people pour into us. In fact, we can't get enough of it, but we're not really pouring into anyone else. This is a situation where often uh, I hear these kinds of things. You know, I just, I just, I go to every study group we offer here. I have read through the Bible in a year, every year for 37 years. Why are you a jerk then? <laughs> I've checked the boxes for 37 straight years. I've taken everybody, I've watched online. I watch 50 churches a week online. I love it all. I can't get enough. Are you pouring in any others? Well, you know, I still, I enjoy creating, I enjoy the content. I enjoy receiving. I enjoy being poured into, but I'm not really pouring in anyone else. Do you see the danger here? You see the danger here? Because two things are happening. At one point, we can't put any more in without it being a huge mess. You've reached essentially your capacity. And whether you may still accumulate more quote unquote biblical knowledge, it's not really having an impact. In fact, growing in Jesus is most effectively sped up by us then turning and giving it to others. 
So if anyone else tries to pour into you, it's a waste of time. And these kinds of statements are made. Yeah, I left that church because I just wasn't being fed anymore. Or I'm not really part of that small group because all they want to do is just pray and love each other. And we're not really getting into the Word deep enough, not really learning anything. And so we get to a point where there's no more capacity for us to gain anything that's going to help us grow in Jesus. We're maxed out. And so if we're letting people pour in, but we're not pouring out into others, there's a point where it really doesn't make any sense to do anymore. Like, we don't even want to bump you for fear of what might happen. Now, there is one more problem. There is one more deficiency that can happen. The first one was you've lit it up, and you're not letting anybody pour into you anymore. Or you're happy to have people pour into you. You can't get enough of it. Um, you've read every Bible study on version to the point that they're now calling you and asking you for ideas. What should we make next on version? I don't know. I've read them all. The third one, and this one is, is, it doesn't look like a dysfunction at first because it appears to be the kind of person that we're talking about where they are more than happy. This is going to be tricky. They are more than happy to pour into others. In fact, they are pouring into others consistently. And at first, this looks like exactly what Paul is talking about. This is fantastic. Oh, look at, you've been teaching in DB Kids since DB Kids started. You've been doing it so long, you're on second generation kids now. Or I've been serving an anomaly. I've seen every high school kid who's ever come through here. Or I've been leading small groups. I help out in the worship band. I'm a greeter. Like you are deeply, deeply invested in other people. And we love that. But you'll notice what's happening. I am so busy pouring out into others, I haven't stopped to let myself be poured into. There's a transaction that's happening here that is fluid, (laughs) pun intended, and consistent. I must have both transactions happening in my life because if I am only doing the pouring out and I'm no longer letting anyone pour in, and again, this could be pride, I've got enough, I know enough, I'm pretty sharp, I know what I'm doing, Uh, or it could be just a sense of obligation, like I just got to, the doors are open to church, I better show up. Oh, you want me to lead another Bible study? Okay. And at this point, we are now completely void of anything we can even pour into people. There's nothing left we can even give because we have nothing. And this is where burnout happens. This is where ministry falls apart. This is where you perhaps go, I've had enough, and we're done. Paul is so, so intentional about this transaction process. Oh, I'm getting a little low. I better get some more. Paul has essentially... Ask Timothy to be part of this process, that he wants this message to be sent to Timothy. Pour out what's been poured in. Pour out what's been poured in. Pour out what's been poured in. Oftentimes, when this type of topic comes up and these conversations begin to take place, there are some people who will ask a very legitimate question. Great illustration, Mark. A lot of fun. Fun to watch. I have this like hankering for blue Kool-Aid now, like I've never had before. But why, I don't know if I really need that. Like, why is that necessary? Why would that be important? And I know in my own life, I can think of two reasons why this is of incredible value. In fact, it's a necessity. It may even be an essential in my walk with Jesus. For me, I can think of two reasons. One is that I naturally drift when I'm not tethered to accountability. My natural inclination is to just casually drift. And you know what happens when you drift? You don't notice it at first. It can be a long time until anyone notices. And if I don't have accountability in my life, I don't have people helping me to be the person that God intended me to be, When I'm left to my own choices and own devices, I can go south pretty quick. I need a person to come alongside me and say, hey, Mark, that third and fourth donut this morning, not necessary. Not necessary. Not necessary. In my Christian walk, 
for many of us know that if, if we're really going to become active in exercise, it's always helpful if you have someone with you. It's tough to do these things in isolation. And so I naturally drift, maybe you feel the same way, and so accountability in both directions, like I'm still letting people pour into me and help me and shape me to become the person God wants me to be, and then I'm intentional about taking that and giving it to others in appropriate situations. But the second reason why I know I need it, and maybe you do too, is that I don't do well in isolation. In fact, nobody does because we were created to crave community and connection. God, who is a relational being, created us to be relational beings. And even if you are an incredible introvert, you still need people in your life. And we need community, we need connection. And the research is showing this. There was a recent survey that came out about a year ago interviewing thousands of Americans, and the numbers were just really, really saddening when they reported that 35% of the people that they interviewed would describe themselves as chronically lonely. 35%, a little over one out of three people would say they are chronically lonely. And a quarter of the people they talked to, 25%, said they had zero close friends, none. And in the person of Jesus and in His gathering the church, we have a solution for that. This is a place where you can be known and to know people, to be in community, to be connected with one another. That's why we need this. So what does this look like practically? Just briefly here at the end, let me give you three simple steps that all of us can do. Some of these will be harder for some of us than others, uh, but just three things that will help us toward biblical influence. If you're sensing in your life, if this morning maybe the Holy Spirit is, is hinting at you that oftentimes we, we fall short in one of those two transactions. We're either not real great at letting people in or we let the wrong people in. Or we're not really great at giving to others. We're kind of becoming the glass that fills up too much and we haven't really let any out yet. So just a couple real simple steps. The first one is you have to allow people in. You have to allow in. As scary as this is for us, you've, we've got to let people into our lives. And again, uh, not to paint everyone this way, because this is a, a broad stroke statement, but for the majority of us, when we don't allow people in, it's either a pride issue, like they're not good enough, or I can't find anyone who really can pour into me, like I'm at the top of the food chain now, or it's a fear, because usually of some hurt we've experienced, uh, we've been burned by people in the past, and both of those are legitimate. But if we could put those away and surround ourselves with positive influencers, you know, people who will really, they're trustworthy, we connect with them, they'll be honest with us. We don't need yes men and women around us. We need people who are honest, who will give us grace and truth. People who will see what we can't see, both positively and negatively. I mean, just consider for a moment what would have happened if Timothy had not joined up with Paul. What if when reading through Acts, when we get to Acts 16 and we're first introduced to Timothy, it says, and Timothy was a young man, and Paul met him, and Timothy went, nah, I'm good. I'll just stay here. But no, if Paul joined him to his ministry. If Paul doesn't have the impact on Timothy that he has, it's probably because Timothy doesn't let him in. Allow in. It's a big part of it. Okay? And it's hard for some of us. And it's hard to find that right place. We've got lots of places where we can allow you in. We'll try to find the right one for you, which brings us to the second one. Join in. Join in. Become part of a biblical community. Become part of a small group. Now, the smart ones in the room are going, wait a second, Mark, you work with small groups here at Desert Breeze. This feels a little manipulative. It is. Not ashamed at all. Because I've seen the value of what being in a biblical community can do for me and for others. I know in my life, when I have struggled, it's when I have not been in biblical community. I tried to go solo. Crashed and burned. In fact, some of the statements that we use around here at Desert Breeze that are our, our rationale for why we are so invested 
in groups. We're so invested in connecting you in the community. Uh, we believe here at Desert Breeze that becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus takes place, really it only takes place in the context of intentional relationships. In fact, a phrase that I heard another pastor use years ago that I've just grabbed onto and I thought this is an easy way to remember this, is that we believe that if you're going to grow spiritually, you don't do that unless you're connected relationally. You might have some growth on your own, in your own, maybe if you have a quiet time or you're reading the Bible in isolation, but you can only go so far because the Scriptures were written to be read in community, to be studied in community, and to be lived out in community. So if you haven't yet, join in. I can't count the number of times I've heard someone say to me, you know, Mark, if it wasn't for our group, we never would have gotten through fill in the blank. Family struggles, death in the family, job loss, financial stress. We navigated through those because we were part of a group. Allow in. Let people in your life. Join in. Become part of a biblical community. And then the last one is then it's your turn to invest in. Invest in. Look for opportunities to pour into others. Look for opportunities to invest in people. Getting outside of ourselves and serving one another and, and sharing our lives with other people is the heartbeat of the church that Jesus created. Uh, our future generations coming behind us, their faith should be our utmost importance. So if you have any ability and desire to work in DB Kids, please do so. The folks over there would love to have you. You're like, I don't really like kids. Well, they probably don't like you either, so it's mutual. <laughs> and you'll have a great time. They'll find something for you to do. Our DB Kids, our Anomaly Student Ministries, our Young Adults Ministry, we've got newly married couples around here, we've got families with young kids. All of us, in whatever stage of life we're in, there is someone behind us who needs us to invest in them. And it's really easy to push back and come up with all the excuses why this isn't for you. You know, uh, I'm just, I'm a pretty new believer. I don't know much about my faith. I don't really know the Bible that well. I've struggled with my faith in the past. <laughs> my life is a mess. You don't want me talking to anyone. Or, you know, I'm just up there in years now, and I don't think I can relate to anybody, or I'm not real, you know, and this is legitimate, I just don't maybe have the physical strength anymore. Um, let me just say to all of those that if any of those are true about you, you are a perfect candidate <laughs> to invest in people because you're real and you're human. And what I also love is I look around even the room this morning, and for the many of you that I know personally, uh, I know that there are individuals out in our world that you can pour into that I would never even have an opportunity to, and I probably wouldn't be very successful. You can influence people I could never influence. That's how necessary all of us are to this. And a couple questions to give you if you're still pondering this, like perhaps maybe you sense you would like to invest more, and you know that this is something that probably you should do, but you don't know where to start. Uh, two questions, again, that I heard years ago. They're really one question from two different perspectives, but they helped shape me in many ways at different times in my life. And the two questions are these. Ask yourself, what am I passionate about? Or maybe even uh, more specifically, who am I passionate about? And that could be an individual, a family, it could be a, a demographic. Maybe you just have a real passion for students, kids, maybe young adults, maybe single adults, maybe young families, men, women. Ask yourself and, and pray about where am I passionate? Where does it lie? Who are the kind of people that I really have a heart for? And then the, the other version of that, it's kind of a more negative question, but it's, it's, it's one to help also is like, what breaks my heart? What am I passionate about? What breaks my heart? Is there a, a situation out there that just, oh, it just, it crushes me, and maybe I could be of influence there? Maybe it's with the food pantry, or perhaps it's with uh, any other ministry around us. 
you know, maybe it's the Dream Center, all these different places where you can plug in and invest. A couple final thoughts. So Paul has said to Timothy, Timothy, I want you to take the things that you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and entrust them to reliable people. And for 2,000 years, this has been the church. This is how the church has survived and thrived because people have invested in people and they've poured into others what's been poured into them. The church is built upon disciples, making disciples, making disciples. And imagine for a moment if that became the heartbeat of Desert Breeze, if all of us sensed the incredible need in our life to have people pouring into us and finding the right people that can speak into our lives and give us wisdom, help us navigate through the hard times of life. And then we also were really excited about finding others and prayerfully being connected to people that we can then pass on what's been given to us. Can you imagine what our church would be like? Imagine what our community would be like? Your personal life would have more fulfillment and meaning and purpose than probably it ever has before. And the legacy of this church, again, what does the faith of the next generation mean to us? How important is a legacy for Desert Breeze? That future generations are lifting this church up and sending it out into the world. It's up to most of us in the room. So I leave you just with two simple questions. Um, who's pouring into you and who are you pouring into? A great challenge on Father's Day, a great chance for us to celebrate those who have poured into us and contemplate who we can impact in the future. Let me pray for us. Father, and today of all days, it's just even a little more meaningful that we get to call you Father uh, and to know that you are our perfect Father that we have that kind of intimate relationship with you and that you love us perfectly as a father and how wonderful that is to know. And I thank you for these words from Paul who challenged Timothy in a very real way. And, and what I love, Jesus, so much about your scriptures is that they were written in a specific time, place, location to people, and yet I can take it and apply it to my life today and see the truth and see the evidence in my life. And so I pray for everyone who's part of Desert Breeze, whether it's one of their first times here or they've been here uh, since it began, those watching, those in the room, God, would you help us to see the value of this and to be deeply moved to be pouring into others as we've been poured into. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Pray in your name. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time. If you want prayer or if you want someone to talk to, I'll be up here as long as other as well as other leaders. Thanks. Have a great Father's Day.